Antonietta is so creative, isn't she? This should be. It's not working. I can try the other one. Oh, there it is. Okay. Antonietta is so creative, isn't she? I think we should have her present the message, the sermon sometime in the near future. Wow. Very nice. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We've been looking at the life of Abraham. It's kind of a long story, isn't it? <laughs> he gets a lot more, a lot more um, chapters than anybody else in the account of, that Moses gives. Let's pray as we get into God's word. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together. And now as we open your word, we pray that your spirit would just guide us and teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've been journeying through Abraham's life, and we've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we're now in Genesis chapter 23. And just going to spend just a few minutes in Genesis 23. There's not a bunch happening, but some important events. So, um, of course, last, last time we looked at, at Genesis 22, uh, Isaac had been offered as a sacrifice. And then God had provided a miraculous sacrifice in his place. So Genesis 23 um, one to three. So Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that's in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. It's interesting that this is the only woman whose death is recorded in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, she is, and it's the only woman whose age is listed. And it's not that women were unimportant, but in their culture, they didn't record these things. But why Sarah, right? Well, she is the mother of the great nation and the, the ancestor of our Savior. And so she is a very special woman, and um, God had chosen her um, for a very special purpose, right? Just like Mary. She was chosen to be the, the mother of this son who would go on to be... To be any three, through his descendants would become Israel, this nation that God had chosen. And so Abraham rose from, so Abraham wept for his wife. He loved Sarah. They had spent a long, long time together. They had gone through a lot of things, hadn't they? And he loved her, and he wept over her as she died. And Abraham rose from, his de, from before his bed and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I'm a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, O my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. We can see that Abraham has developed some healthy relationships with his neighbors, hasn't he? He's um, a stab. They, they see him as a prince among them. They, it, it's clear that there's a respect and a relationship there, and that Abraham has done his best to make peace as far as possible. That's not always possible, is it? But as far as possible, we're called to live at peace with our neighbors. We need to find ways to smooth relations as far as possible without sacrificing principle. And so they respect Abraham here, it's clear. And they say, you can have a grave among us. Even though Abraham no, owns no land in Canaan, but Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and it's apparent that he's at the city gate where they conduct business at their town. And he spoke with them saying, if it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site." Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even all who went in at the gate of his city, saying, 
No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. But Abraham bowed before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will only please listen to me, I will give you the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Then Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver? What is that between me and you? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephraim. Ephron and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. Ephron's field, which is in, was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre, the field and cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field that were within all the confines of its borders were deeded over. And so Abraham, for a possession in the pr presence of the sons of Heth, before all who went in at the gate of his city. And of course, this is near to where Abraham had been camping, right? We read that earlier that he had camped there at the Oaks of Mamre, and he's familiar with this place. And now he has purchased this property so he can bury his dead. And it's interesting, this whole um, dance that they have, right, of negotiation of how they say, no, we'll give it to you. And he so no, I want to buy it. And then Ephron says, well, it's only worth this amount, but I'll give it to you. And <laughs> it's an interesting negotiation, isn't it? And sometimes here in Micronesia, negotiations can kind of go like that, <laughs> where there's this whole dance of the culture, this, this way of negotiating that's not just forthright, upfront. Uh, how much do you want? And okay. <laughs> and so very interesting. And he's able to purchase this field. And there... He um, is able to bury Sarah, his wife, in the cave at the field at Machpelah, facing Mamre, that's in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. And so he buried his dear wife. It was a sad time for Abraham. Um, now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. And you'll, you'll recall that um, this servant of Abraham's is the one who was... Abraham believed he was going to end up being Aaron. In fact, he complained to God that he had still had no son, and this man, Eliezer, would end up being his heir. And, of course, Abraham trusted this man a lot. Obviously, he was the head of the household way back then. and I'm sorry, the head of this, the servants, the head of, head of household under Abraham. And to this day now, Abraham is entrusting him with now an even greater responsibility. Go back to my country, to my relatives, and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from which you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying, to your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. No. And so you can see it's very serious. Abraham is really serious. He, he's an old man, right? And perhaps because of his age, he doesn't want to take on this journey. Or perhaps because he's in the promised land that God has promised him and he doesn't want to return back to that land that, of his birth uh, for whatever reason. And he doesn't send Isaac, who is a young, still a healthy younger man. Um, he sends his servant back to the land to secure a wife, to find a wife for his son. In Amos 3.3 we, 3, 3, we read, No one who fears God can without danger connect himself with one who fears him not. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And so we see here one of the reasons, the primary reason why Abraham is not going 
to get a wife for his son Isaac from the people of Canaan. We understand, we've already read about Sodom and Gomorrah, about the wickedness, about the idolatry, and why God is, is planning to destroy this people in just a few, a, few, um, a few years from now. Well, 400 some years, right? But he's eventually going to destroy them because of their wickedness. And if his son marries one of these women from the Canaanites, what will be the result? What will be the result of, of their marriage? And so Amos tells us, can two walk together except they be agreed? And for 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? And really, this part of the message is, um, is very much for young people, right? Who are we going to marry? How is that going to work out for us in the long run? Do they love God and do they serve Him too? Or are they just of the world. And for those of us who work with youth or have children, guiding them and teaching them so that they make the right decision for that lifelong partner. It's really one of the most important decisions in life, isn't it? It's that decision to get married and the person that you marry. It is a very, very serious, serious decision. Um, and the scripture bears that out. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. And Abraham knows that his son is very special, right? It's his promised son, not the other son. Um, in fact, Ishmael, because of the influence of his mother, and I think I have a couple of quotes on that. Let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit further maybe later. But Ishmael, um, because his mother's Egyptian, right? She's not a believer in the true God, she finds a wife for him in Egypt, or wives for him, Egyptians apparently, the scripture leads us to believe, she sends home for wives for him, and he takes a different course. Even though Abraham has raised him and taught him about the true God, his heart is drawn away by these other women, and of course the Ishmaelites are become a huge problem to the Israelites down through history, don't they? Um, they it's very sad how, how Ishmael's heart is turned away from God. So, continuing on here with the story, Genesis 24, 9 and 10. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. I think there's one other example of this in Scripture. It's not a common practice, but somehow they have this oath, apparently at their, this time in history, um, and this is the way they conduct this oath. He says... Put your hand under my thigh and swear to me that, you will, that you'll follow my instructions. And what trust that Abraham has in his servant Eliezer, huh? He really, truly trusts this man. They are, this is perhaps his closest um, companion outside of Sarah, who's now dead. And he sends his servant then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master, set out a variety of good things of his master's in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. What city did he go to? Nahor. Who is that, by the way? That's Uncle Nahor, right? <laughs> it's Uncle Nahor. And interestingly, the commentary mentions um, that there is archaeological evidence. They found cuneiform tablet that mentioned this city. Um, not Haran, no, it's not another name for Haran, where, which is mentioned earlier in Abraham's journey where he, he stopped with his father, his family, but Nahor. Um, and so, um, so they journeyed, and you can see that they were living somewhere down here in the Negev, in the south of the country of Israel. And, they tra and he traveled way back up there into Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, to find a wife. Why? Why did he go there? Well, even though Abraham's family apparently had some idols, well, we find that later with Jacob, right? Going back to visit Laban, who we're going to see in this story. Um, but they also knew about the true God, and they did worship the true God. Abraham worshiped the true God, and apparently his father did also, and his family, they had not completely lost the knowledge of the true God, um, the great I Am. And so... Abraham knew that his family worshipped 
the true God, and he wanted to get a wife from them, and I did, I'm just thinking now that for some people, of course, it's a question, why were they intermarrying with relatives, right? Is that a question for anyone? Shania says, why were cousins marrying? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the kids, why were, at this point in time, God had not commanded that they not marry close relatives. It was still allowed. In fact, Noah, um, I mean, going back to Adam and Eve, of course, their children were marrying their sisters, right? And at the time of Noah, there were three sons with three wives, and obviously they had to marry their cousins um, in order to populate the earth. So to us today, it's a strange thing, but at that time, that was how, how God provided, and it wasn't a strange thing. It wasn't a weird thing. It was the way that God had provided for them to populate the earth. And so um, it wasn't a strange thing for Abraham to send back to his own family. In fact, the commentary suggested that this was a common thing, that you would marry somebody from your tribe. And so Abraham sends his, his servant on this long, long journey back to find a bride for Isaac. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well. Um, the servant went on his way. It doesn't tell us about his journey, but he got there. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Can you picture that in your mind? Can you imagine it? The camels kneeling down there at the well, a beautiful um, sunset, and the young ladies coming out of the town to draw water in the cool of the evening. And so he said, he prays, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. We can see that Eliezer, because of Abraham's example, has developed a relationship with the true God. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so Eliezer has this faith also in God, and he says, God, Please grant me success today. <laughs> he says, Behold, I'm standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so that I may have a drink, and who answers, Drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed to your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. It's really a prayer of faith, isn't it? It's really a prayer of faith. How many young ladies are coming out to draw water? And he's praying, the one that I speak to, may that be the one for my master. He's been on a long journey, and he is ready to find that young lady that will be Isaac's wife. And before he had finished speaking to God, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. And by the way, in the last chapter, she was mentioned also, right? <laughs> we read, actually, some of the descendants of Nahor were listed there. And so, this young lady, who he, the servant doesn't know her, the girl was very beautiful, a virgin, no man had had relations with her. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. And then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me drink a little water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. <laughs> Can you imagine there at the well? He's there. He's prayed, Lord, the one that I ask, may that be the one, the chosen one for Isaac. A very special woman is needed for Isaac. Isaac is the promised son and he is the one that will be the father of this great nation. And God guides him to this young woman, and she is willing to water all ten camels. Oh, that's a job and a half, right? <laughs> I mean, if camels can go a long way in the desert, in a dry place, and they may not have drunk for a while, it's probably at least a jar or two for each camel. So it's a, it's a, she's willing to help the stranger who's in need to provide for his camels, which is quite a bit of sweaty work, hauling this water out from the spring. 
and she offers him a drink in kindness. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing ten shekels in gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. And certainly this is not out of the ordinary. There's no hotel in town, right? <laughs> it's a, a village. He says, please, do you have a place that I could stay with your family? And he gives her gifts. Um, he believes that God has led him to the chosen young lady. Again, she said to him, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshiped the Lord. He said, Lord, you've led me to the, to the woman for my master's son. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. <laughs> Hallelujah, huh? What a blessing. The servant says, God has done, he's done this great thing. And then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. We know about Laban, don't we? Uncle Laban. And when he, had, when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, Got any more gold, buddy? <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> Knowing Laban later, maybe he was thinking that. I, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? And so the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels, gave straw and feed to the camels, and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. And when the food was set before him, but when the food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. <laughs> He's not a, the, this servant is not a man to beat around the bush, is he? He's not one to waste any time. He gets to the town of Nahor and he says, Lord, let it be the young lady that I speak to. He gets to the house and he says, I may be hungry, but we've, we've got business to take care of first. God's guided me here, and I need to tell you. And so they said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich, and he's given flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Suppose the woman does not follow me. He said to me, The Lord whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful and you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my relatives, and if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. So I came today to the spring and said, Oh, the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if, you, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful, behold, I am standing by the spring. May it be that the maiden who comes out to draw and to whom I say, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she will say to me, You drink and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew. And I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. Yeah, she had a ring on her nose. That was the custom then. It's uh, popular again today, right? 
<laughs> that was the custom of their times. And <laughs> he said, this is all. It's just miraculous. And, he, and I bowed low and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So now if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, let me know that I might turn to the right hand or the left. Tell me now. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go knocking on your relatives' doors. Now tell me, what is it? <laughs> he gets right to the point, doesn't he? He tells the whole story, and he comes straight to the point. Now are you going to let me take Rebecca with me back to Isaac, or what's it going to be? <laughs> but he also tells of the miraculous intervention of God, doesn't he? He tells how God has intervened, and he says, I believe God has chosen, basically he's saying, I believe God has miraculously chosen Rebecca, and it sure doesn't hurt that she's beautiful too. Poor Isaac, what if he'd brought back some ugly girl? Beauty is just a bonus, right? Proverbs says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. So beauty is not the number one characteristic of a godly wife. And so, <laughs> let's see what happens. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, the matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you good or bad. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Praise God, huh? So you can see that these people do. Abraham's relatives do believe in the true God. And they see that God's hand is in this. And they said, we can't say, because it's, it's God who's spoken. And when Abraham's servant heard these, their words... He jumped up and did a little dance. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? That's what he felt like doing. He bowed down himself to the ground before the Lord, and he worshiped God again. And then the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments, gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. And when they arose in the morning, he said, "'Send me away to my master.'" <laughs> He's not willing to, to waste any time, is he? Isaac needs a wife. I've been sent on business, and I'm not turning to the right or the left. I'm headed back home. I've, we've finished the business here. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days. Say ten. Afterwards she may go. And he said to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We'll call the girl and consult her wishes. <laughs> they were hoping, at least let us have a little bit of time with her. This is all such a surprise. Daily life has just been going on for years and years, and all of a sudden you just want to snatch this girl and take her away. We need at least ten days with her. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And thus they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. That's really a prophecy, isn't it? Of Rebecca's descendants. Thousands times ten thousands, inspired by the Spirit, they bless her with this blessing. May your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. And then Rebecca arose with her maids. They mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and departed. Now Isaac had come from going to Beer Lahairoi, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebecca Talbot, Talbot tells the story. She's the speaker of Jesus 101. She says, what, Beth? I'm sorry, Elizabeth Talbot. Elizabeth Talbot tells a story of how um, she was dating her husband-to-be, and they would talk on the phone, and one day he told her, the camels are coming. <laughs> the camels are coming. That's coded, isn't it? She said they would study the Bible together on the phone, and they would talk together. The camels are coming. <laughs> and he was referring to this story. The camels are coming. The camels are coming. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. What do you think Isaac is thinking? How do you think Isaac is feeling? How would you feel? What do you think? What, what is it, George? Woo-hoo? 
That's what Elizabeth Talbot says. <laughs> woo <-hoo. laughs> You know, it's a different culture in a different time, isn't it? And you can see here that we saw, last, as we read in the last chapter, how Isaac loves and trusts his father Abraham. There is that relationship there that can go through anything. And Isaac trusts that his father will find the right wife for him. That's beautiful, isn't it? It's not our culture today, but I think there are some important lessons that we can learn from it. Very important lessons. He trusts that his father has some godly wisdom. Isaac at this time is 40 years old, we, we learn in the next chapter. And so, 40 years old and he's just getting married? Well, they waited a little while until their brains had matured. It's not a bad idea, is it? And they lived a little bit longer, slightly. How old was Rebecca? Did it say 127? And Abraham lives to 175. So he lived a little bit longer. There's nothing wrong with waiting to get married, is it? Until our brains have matured a little bit and we can make that right choice that can last a lifetime and not just a year or two. That's really valuable, isn't it? Are, are you guys listening back there in the very back? Yes, thank you. That's important. I'm picking on the young people. <laughs> Don't rush into something. I tell Frank, Frank, Frank has been working with us at Joy FM for, I don't know, five years or something. He's like 25 or 26. I fr say, Frank, I'm proud of you. You really are taking your time. No rush in getting married. No need to rush into it. It's a serious decision. She may look beautiful, but he may look handsome, but wow, you're going to have to live with this for the rest of your life. What kind of a person are they? What, how, how, will, how will their relationship with God affect you? And so Isaac trusts his dad is making the right choice for him. And so he's waiting, and he's watching, and George, I'm sure George is right that he was pretty excited. <laughs> I'm going to have a wife. Dad has sent for a wife for me, and it's going to be a blessing to me and a joy to have a wife. And remember, his mom had just died earlier, right? So he's lonely. And he would love to have a woman in his, in, his, in his life at this time, a wife in his life. And so he's looking forward to this, this time when he's going to have his wife, and he's looking for that, that uh, caravan to come. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. And then she took her veil and covered herself. And that, that's the tradition still today, right? In the eastern countries, we're hearing about that in Afghanistan, that this is a really going to be a big controversy with the Taliban who want women to stay at home and wear their veil. And this is not quite the right veil. The artist had the wrong idea. It's actually, you can't see the face, but you can just barely see the eyeballs. So it's not quite that. That's more of a European-American wedding veil kind of thing. But you can imagine, right? She covers herself. She says, I'm going to cover myself for my husband so he doesn't see me until after the wedding. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. And Isaac's like, come on, brother, hurry up. Finish the story. Come on. I want to see my wife. And then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And what does it say? And what? And what? What does it say, Easy? He loved her. He loved her. Isn't that beautiful? He loved her. And thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You, you, did, did you know that love is not just an emotion? Uncle Brooke says that's right. Did you know that love is a choice? It is, right? It's a choice every day. You know, our emotions can get wild and crazy, and it's not necessarily love. Sometimes it could be lust. Sometimes, you know, love has emotion too, but <laughs> we can get carried away with emotions, right? How, how many of you can think of a, a love song that says, Go with your heart? I remember as a teenager, it was rock set. Listen to your heart when he's calling for you. Listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. 
I didn't put that in my sermon, I just thought of that, but, right? But that's a common lyric. That kind of a lyric is in so many songs, right? Just listen to your heart. Follow your heart, George says. What do you think? Do you think that's wise biblical counsel? You think that's a good, good way to live? The teenagers are grinning. <laughs> George says, maybe not. There's some, there's some wisdom in not just following your heart. If we just go with emotion, we can end up into a lot of trouble, right? Can. And so we need some wise, godly counsel, and our parents have lived a little bit longer than we have, and sometimes they can provide a little guidance. There are other people that maybe, hopefully, we're not just disconnected. And sometimes young people go to, way to college and they're just totally disconnected. They don't have any older people that love the Lord in their lives. That's why it's important to get involved in a church, right? A church family that loves you that can also help to mold and guide you. And so it's good to get some counsel from older people. What do you think about this person I'm thinking about marrying? What, I, what is your counsel on that? Give me some counsel on that. And so, so of course, in Isaac's situation, it was an arranged marriage. I don't think any, anyone have an arranged marriage. Come, your marriage was arranged by your parents? No? Really easy? Are you sure? <laughs> it does still happen today in some countries, right? But not in our culture. That's really far removed from us. Um, but we can ask for counsel and seek counsel from our parents because maybe they see, see some things that we do not see. And Isaac was wise enough. And Patri the book Patriarchs and Prophets is a commentary on this, on, on what's happening here. And it says that the young people, their, their opinion and their, des or their desire was not ignored in this, this marriage planning. So even though the parents made their arrangements, and yet it wasn't that the young people couldn't say how they felt and couldn't say, please, no, I don't want this. I don't want this person. I don't want to marry this person. They had a voice. So that's a very interesting thought, and that, that's, that's really, that makes it a little bit more uh -huh. <laughs> acceptable maybe in our, in our cultural minds to think that at least the young people had some voice in the situation. And for Isaac, how did it work out? How do you think it worked out for Isaac? Man, you got, I put you to sleep. I'm sorry. It's 8.30 and I already put you to sleep. I can, I can still see the clock. <laughs> it says 8.30. How, how did it work out for Isaac and Rebecca? Fairly well until later, Uncle Brooks says. For the most part, it was a healthy relationship, right? They had some shortcomings. They had some little issues, as, as did Abraham. <laughs> but they loved one another, and they were together for life. And that, that's God's plan. And so when we say that love is a choice, it means that even in the hard times, that we stick with it. Right? Even when times are difficult, we stick with it. And sometimes, and so please don't take this wrong. I know we all, we have different life situations and different histories and stories. And it is what it is, right? History is history. So whatever state you're in, please don't feel like I'm speaking to you personally. Whatever the Holy Spirit impresses on your heart. Um, so I'm not, I'm just thinking of that now. I'm just telling you, please don't take this too personally. The Lord knows our story, and he loves us, and whatever is, is, and forgiveness is there, and mercy and grace. But for those of us who are in a marriage relationship, we chose to be married, and we choose to stay. Amen? And for whatever state of affairs the rest of us are in, the Lord has mercy and love and grace, and let's stay in the place that God's placed us now. And his mercy and grace are sufficient for us. So, and for us as young people, wow. There are some wonderful, wonderful things that we can learn from this story. If there is any subject which should be carefully considered and which the counsel of older and more experienced persons should be sought, it is the subject of, I'm hoping that the youth in the back would say it, it is the subject of marriage. <laughs> That's a serious business, isn't it? Very serious business. Seek counsel. This is from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. 
it is the subject of marriage. If ever the Bible was needed as a counselor, if ever divine guidance should be sought in prayer, it is before taking a step that binds persons together for life. And that's God's plan, right? That marriage should be for life. It's not a come and go. Today in our culture and society, it's from one to the next to the next. I know so many people here on Guam, and it happens elsewhere. I just, this is where I've lived for so long. They have one girlfriend and boyfriend after the next, and you can see how broken and messed up their, their lives are. They're not happy. They're, they're broken. There's not joy because they had this girl and that girl and the other. It, it, they're broken. They're broken. So don't believe the devil's lies. It's a, such an important, important thing for us to seek counsel on and, and godly wisdom. And so for those of us who are older, in a kind and gentle way as we have opportunity, we can prayerfully give guidance to young people, right? Prayerfully, gentle guidance to, to youth and young adults to make wise decisions, to not rush in, and by God's grace, that relationship can last. It is a commitment that God designed to last through life. Um, of course, there are things that do come up sometimes, unfortunately, where it doesn't ha work out that way, but... But God knows. God knows. And he loves us. And he sees us through it all. So, but it is his design for life. So, it's a beautiful story, isn't it? A beautiful love story. And the bonus was, the bonus for Isaac was what? Any bonus for Isaac? She was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> she was beautiful. So I just as his mother was, right? Sarah was we've heard throughout the history that Sarah was beautiful as well. Beautiful story. We're getting close to the end of Abraham. I hope you've enjoyed some of the lessons we've learned from his life. Amazing man and from the other people that he've met and interacted with on his journey and from Sarah as well. Um, humans, but God used them in a mighty way as they had faith in him. Can you say amen to that? He wants to use us in whatever situation we're in, to his glory and honor. All right, we have, we don't have special music today, I don't think, no, so. <laughs> You're volunteering, Brennan? Okay. Are you saying yes, Brennan? Okay. Brennan's going to give us special music as we conclude this morning. <laughs>